yeah, regular okay. meeting of the Board of Education to order. Um, if I could ask everybody to stand and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. Sarah Ooh. Benjamin. Here. Uh, R. Michael. Here. Ara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Okay, we note Casey absent and that uh, Don is joining us via. Um, uh, virtually, um, we have a quorum present and per board policy 2 to 20, um, Don is able to join us as well as vote during the meeting. Um, to review the agenda, we have a very full evening. Um, we have two public hearings um, that because of all the guests that we have for student recognition, uh, I believe will be brief. Um, one on our e-learning plan and the uh, following on the ESSER three grant fund spending plan. Uh, then we will invite members of the public to uh, comment. I will note that during those two public hearings, there will be time for public comments on those items. Any general public comments uh, will be invited after both hearings are declared closed. Um, in my president's report, we have a lot of student recognition. Um, we have an educational presentation, and we will be honoring our outgoing school board reps and recognizing our new ones. Uh, the superintendent has a report. Uh, we have a consent vote agenda. Um, these are items, uh, uh, the normal day-to-day -day business items for the district that we have discussed extensively in committee two weeks ago. We will hear from both of our committees uh, for program and personnel committee as well as our facilities and finance committee. Uh, we'll have an update on ISB and CEDAL, discuss future agenda items. Uh, we will retire to executive, dis executive session um, for the purpose of collective negotiating matters under um, Illinois School Code 5 ILCS 120 2C2 about lease of property 5 ILCS 120 2C6 uh, and finally, employment of an employee 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C1, all of which under the Open Meetings Act, uh, we discuss uh, in executive, dis executive session. Um, when we finish that, we will return to open session and we will uh, be taking a vote on the lease of property item and then we will adjourn. So, um, it is 7.03, I'm going to declare our hearing on e-learning plan for, Sorry. Sorry. oh, thank you. No, I forgot to do that. Um, even though Don is joining us virtually, um, as the board secretary in his absence, we do need signatures on things that we vote on after this meeting. So we are gonna assign a secretary pro tem, which is Kara Benjamin. And now at 7.04, I will declare the public hearing on our e-learning plan. 2022-2023 through the 2024-25 school years open at 7.04 p.m. And I will ask for our e-learning plan presentation. Thank you. Uh, our e-learning plan is uh, the plan that uh, the district submits to the Regional Office of Education for approval to be able to use uh, up to five emergency days in the event of uh, something like a snow day or a power outage. This is not a remote learning plan for long-term remote learning. Um, if you'll recall, the district adopted uh, the first e-learning plan under original legislation in 2019, uh, in the 2019-20 school year. And so it's uh, after three years time for renewal uh, for the next three years. The plan provides uh, information about how students will access um, their learning and uh, attendance will be taken. Um, it fulfills all the requirements of the legislation and basically has students on an 
emergency day, logging into their Google Classroom to receive assignments as they did frequently during the period of remote learning in the district. So this is simply an outline of how the district will use e-learning on emergency days in the future. Uh, and we will, once the board approves, present this to the Regional Office of Education for their approval. And then we'll be able to begin using e-learning days uh, when the school year begins as hopefully unnecessary. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions from board members? Okay, seeing none, I invite public comments on this item. Going once. Okay, I see no public comments, so I'm going to declare, declare the hearing closed at 7.06 p.m. Just to make a comment that we will be voting on this later in the agenda. In the Just, consent yeah, agenda. Yeah. Um, and no discussion on it will take place at that time because it is part of our consent vote agenda. Okay, uh, moving right on, I'm going to declare our public hearing on ESSER 3 grant fund spending plan open at 7.06 p.m. Can I please ask for our uh, grant fund spending plan presentation? Uh, yeah, so the, the plan that's in included in the packet is the same plan that we've discussed at previous meetings and even most recently our committee meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, so a, a little over 500,000, 526, 527,000 allocated through ESSER 3. 20% has to be used for um, the loss of learning. Uh, and so we've, ad we've addressed those in the interventionists uh, and the tutoring and the rest for HVAC improvements um, that were done in summer of 2021 to increase ventilation in areas of our buildings that we noticed either a lack of or insufficient ventilation. So that's the plan. Um, same as we discussed at the committee meeting, there's no changes since then. Great, thank you. Um, at this time, I invite public comments on the SR3 grant fund spending plan. And I see none going once. Okay, I'm gonna declare the hearing closed at 7.07 .07 p.m. Okay, at this time, I would like to invite any public comment. Um, I did not see any on the sign-in sheet, but if anybody would like to address the board generally on any matters, now is your chance. Okay, seeing none, we are going to move right on. Um, it is my privilege under the president's report to start off with student recognition. And Dr. Gilliam is gonna start us off. Good evening, everybody. I'm John Gilliam, the principal of Vernon Hills High School. Uh, and we're proud this evening to bring you our state champion wind ensemble. Uh, a couple, yep, yep, applause. Is I got a text from uh, Dr. Russell. Uh, it was kind of, oh, by the way, we're state champions. Uh, anyone that knows D128 recognizes that music runs deep and is really good around these parts. And so, uh, this is the fifth such state championship for our wind ensemble under the direction of Mr. Randy Sundell. Uh, and I'm gonna invite uh, Dr. Drew Russell up here just to chat a little bit more about the accomplishment. Uh, but I wanted to say for sure, congratulations to all you mus musicians. We're glad you're here and uh, proud of your work. Drew. All right, so the, the way that a state champion is selected in the state of Illinois is with something called the super state competition, which happens down at the University of Illinois every year. So groups participate from all over the state uh, at, in various classes in sending in audition tapes. And essentially hundreds of these tapes are sent in and I don't know what, 20 or so? Yeah, so about 20 total for the entire state are even accepted to participate in the competition. We've historically, th that's been something that we've done kind of every year because of how strong the program is that, that Randy has built. But this year in particular, I think it was really just the hallmark of what Vernon Hills is. We, we, had so, we had kids that were involved in so many different things this year. We actually had to elect to move up a class so they could take their AP test, but also they were, we had three students that were in the orchestra's dance performance. So in order to enable them to do all of these things, which is really at the heart of what Vernon Hills is, we had to move up a class. So despite that, they still won the stinking thing. How about that? So, uh, 
quite a process. It's, it's one of the smallest groups I, I remember ever putting together. Um, and it's, you know, coming out of, of, of two years or however many years of, of performing band online, it really is just remarkable what they've been able to do this year. And it's because of their talent and especially the talent of the person who I'm going to invite up next to butcher their names. This is Randy Sundell, <laughs> maestro. Oh, as we read your name, please come on up. We're not going to give you a certificate right now. That's just too, too cumbersome. But come on up and we'll, uh, we'll get a picture when we're done. Okay, Leah Alterson, Anoki Amara, Trish Asher, Rodrigo Gomez, Eliana Burnett, Ella Bohm, I, Sophie Cottle, Sarali. Anna Chen, Sammy Cirillo, Ben Evans, Nathan Fache, Jason Frega, Jack Gagamoth, Maddie Goss, Noah Grinstein, Eric Hernandez, August Jones, Joshua Kalinowski, Evan Kim, Eastnick, Abby Lerman, Mia Malfate, EJ Mendoza, Aniela Mesa, Joe Miller. Luke Moffitt, Tyler Park, Dimitri Poulos, Rokas, Rumsis, Ariel Schifrin, M. Slaw, Libby Yates, Irene Yu, Maddie Zimmerman, and Margaret Zwicky. Congratulations, Vernon Hills. Libertyville High School also has a student recognition tonight. Uh, our student was running late, so I am going to talk really slow <laughs> to try to delay. I can't tap dance, so but uh, the time has come uh, to introduce um, a student who was the MVP of our sixth in-state LHS mathematics team uh, to talk about this student and perhaps to introduce him if he runs in at the last minute is our outstanding LHS math teacher and math 
team coach, Mr. Rick Brenner. <laughs> he told me he was running a minute late and I think he meant he was running a minute late. <laughs> Uh, Nikhil is, as Dr. K said, our mathematics team MVP for the year. Um, actually, I think I could say that for the last two years. Last year, there was a stretch where he had seven perfect competitions in a row, mm. which is just unheard of. Uh, he led the high school mathematics modeling contest to the international mathematics modeling contest two years in a row. He was our regional champion in pre-calculus. He was fifth in state in pre-calculus. He was fifth overall in the Illinois Math League competition. Um, I can't read what I wrote next. <laughs> oh, orals, hello. He was third in orals in the division and he was nominated <clears throat> by the NSML North Suburban Math League coaches as all division. Congratulations in absentia to Nikhil Patel. And Mr. Brenner, if Dr. K and Mr. Brenner, if he does arrive at any point during our meeting, we will be delighted to pause and congratulate him. Yeah. He looks like. Um, and at this yeah. point, um, we're going to move on to our student board reps, oh, but, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. What I was good. What I was getting at was if parents are leaving, I just want to say that we know that state champions don't create themselves and we thank you. And we congratulate you as well for all the hard work, all the lessons, all the driving, everything you did to support your kids. Um, we are incredibly proud of fine arts uh, at both of our buildings. And um, we thank you for everything that you did to support um, your student musician. And now we will uh, move on to our educational presentation that we have been uh, very anxious to hear about. Um, there was a civil rights professional learning tour and we are delighted to introduce Dr. Rita Fisher to present uh, everything that we would love to know about your trip. Thank you. Presentation to share. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the board very much for their support of unique professional learning in District 28, recognizing the value of um, adult learning and how that transforms not only their professional life, but certainly the impact that it has on students in our classrooms across the district. So thank you so much for your support of this kind of learning. Um, I have a team here with me tonight to share uh, uh, the story of our journey, but also the story of immersive learning in D128. Some of them are here with us personally and others will be joining us through their videos and quotes throughout the presentation to talk about the transformations they experienced on this civil rights tour. I'd like to introduce those who are here in person, Amanda Carroll, Vernon Hills High School Social Studies Instructor. <laughs> Vernon Hills High School Special Services Social Worker. Ryan Boss, Libertyville High School Social Studies Department Chair. You might know Mary Toderick, our Director of Communication. Uh, they will be joining in the presentation um, as, as we kind of flip back and forth between uh, various experiences. But the theme of our presentation tonight is, is uh, several, um, we're looking at several themes throughout the presentation. The first is the transformational... Oh, I'm going to stop right now and uh, allow for recognition of... Uh, a student who was running one minute late. <laughs> we are proud to introduce you to Nikhil Patel, our LHS uh, math team 2022 MVP. Yeah. 
I had a game and then I came to That was a happy interruption. <laughs> oh. So, uh, as I said, uh, the theme of our presentation tonight is both the transformation that educators experience while engaged in immersive professional learning and the impact that that has on student learning. And so uh, you will hear um, from various educators tonight uh, regarding their experience and their plans for using that experience to uh, immediately make changes to uh, how students experience their learning in the district. The first slide uh, was the entire group, and maybe we just want to Go back one, sorry. Um, we were so excited on the streets of Montgomery, all 17 of us, to wander across a Maya Angelou quote that spoke to us as much as her quote uh, that defines our mission. Uh, Success is loving life and daring to live it. Uh, immersive place-based learning definitely has educators living and experiencing the learning that they bring every day to students in their classroom. And for all of us, the transformative effect of that learning um, can be seen uh, throughout the, um, the uh, stories that we'll hear tonight. So um, we were just excited to gather under Maya Angelou's quote in Montgomery. The immersive place-based learning experience began really with a project-based learning conference in the summer of 2016 that Mandy was a part of, and Mary was also. It was a small group of educators that um, worked with educators from across the world to learn how to create project-based experiences, and while they're designed a project to implement in their classroom the very next year. And that model um, was kind of fresh in my mind over the years as I too engaged in a place-based learning experience at the Global Youth Leadership Summit in um, uh, Finland and Milan, Italy. Um, while there, I had just come from the second project-based learning experience and thought, what if we could connect that project design with immersive learning. I had traveled with groups of teachers of the year from across the country. We interacted with international educators. It was a scholarship that I was grateful to have received, but it set the planning in motion for the design of what has become a really unique model of learning in District 128. We gather educators from both schools, different disciplines, and travel to places where we learn about the culture, history, um, people of uh, the place, and let our imaginations inspire us to create a learning design that will implement uh, in our classrooms or in a settings with students um, the very uh, next opportunity that we can. Since that first uh, 2016 experience, almost 70 different educators from across the district have engaged in immersive learning, place-based learning, and or project-based learning. And you'll hear their testimonies about that tonight. It's my fervent wish that every educator in this district at some time uh, during their time here has the opportunity to engage in one of these opportunities connected to their passion, aligned to our mission, and that kind of fuels their professional growth in a way that almost all the participants have said at one point or another is to them life-changing. It's not very often that you engage in uh, professional learning that changes your life. And you'll hear how that this model has done that for our educators. So um, this picture up here was taken in a workshop in Berlin. The first year that we traveled to Berlin, our educators presented our daring mission and their project designs for feedback to the groups of educators uh, from across the United States that were designing their own projects based on the experience that we engaged in. We shared ideas, they provided feedback. The picture here, was um, Mandy's work working with Sarah Greenswag in designing the American studies driving questions that still to this day continue to evolve and impact students across both high schools in our district. So that's the history of the model. Now we're going to move on to 
this specific experience um, from April 6th through 10th uh, this, of this year, 2022. This group of 17 educators traveled from Atlanta to Selma to Montgomery to Birmingham and back to Atlanta again oftentimes sharing our experiences on the buses between these locations and um, comparing notes and designing learning en route. Um, the itinerary was rich with uh, immersive experiences that you'll hear about as we continue. So I've been very fortunate to attend um, several of these immersive learning experiences. And I just want to echo what Rita is saying with the fact that each time I've come back and have felt completely transformed as an educator um, and inspired. And it's immediately when I return home, I'm thinking about what can I do differently in my class? How can I impact students differently? Um, and so this really is a transformational um, journey when you go on these trips. Um, so the immersive learning for me, why I love it so much is that it allows me to really reflect on my own practices. Um, when I've been in Berlin, meeting with students there and seeing how they learn and how they, um, you know, structure um, their schools to now being here in this country and seeing um, firsthand, you know, I teach history um, and I feel like I know the civil rights movement pretty well um, since I teach it all the time for 18 years. But I can say that after experiencing this trip, it will forever change how I approach this topic, um, not just the topic of civil rights, but also the importance of my role today um, working with students. Um, the other thing that it gives a really great opportunity for is that I'm a mom of three. So when I leave home, when I leave school, I almost call school home because it feels like it is. <laughs> um, but when I go home, I have to immediately switch into mom mode, which is usually just an Uber driver. Um, but this trip allowed me to like 24 hours a day, we're like living the experience and we don't stop talking about teaching and about students and about what we can do, um, to offer more to them. And it's so inspiring and it's, I don't want to call my, my own children distractions, but I did in this quote, cause I said <laughs> that without my distractions of my kids, it just really allowed me to commit my full mental capacity to really thinking about me as an educator, um, my responsibility to all students that I teach, um, and just really being around these amazing colleagues that I have um, to share this experience with. Um, so it's absolutely transformational in that sense. So when we started, go ahead, Bo. Thanks. Um, so we started our trip in Atlanta and we went to the King Center, um, which I had been before, um, but once going now, I, I kind of put again that like professional hat on to think about how can I teach this experience to um, my own students. And so there is a walk of fame that we um, were able to actually step on and see um, and reflect on all those names that are there in front of us. Um, and then there's also at the King Center, it has his birth home, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, as well as his memorial. Um, so there was, you can go ahead. Oh. So here there's a reflection um, pond with his memorial and you're sitting there. And again, I think about what it, the power this can be for students. You know, I talk about Dr. King every year, uh, multiple times, but to actually be there at his memorial reflecting on his impact, um, just the power of that. So this quote is from Judy Newberger, who was also on the trip. And she said, this tour allowed me to take a step away from my responsibilities in my small world and take a giant step towards my equity journey, finally having the chance to listen to others, learn more about our nation's tragic history, and really discover how much I have yet to learn. Um, so that really kind of struck all of us, this idea of we're never stop learning. Hello, my name is Liz. Can you hear me? I can't. There we go. Okay. Um, so I have a lot to say, so you need to make sure you can hear me. Um, but anyways, the reason why um, I went on this trip is um, it came from, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, a lot of conversations with um, my colleague, Madeline Powell, and just talking about our different experiences um, in this community, just because of some of obvious differences um, that, that I am a white woman and she is a black woman. And um, this kind of started this whole conversation. I am um, was raised in Libertyville. I graduated from Libertyville High School in 2001. And um, 
something that I, I, I chose to raise my family here too. So I want to mention that. So I love this place, but I recognize that we're not perfect. And, um, some of my experiences is like, I didn't have a lot of diverse opinions maybe, or experiences. I just didn't have that. So when I went into this, I want to say, how can we provide our students with like another outlook, another story, another angle. Oftentimes I think when we think of civil rights, we think of it as a Southern, you know, experience and maybe not as much up here, but going on this trip, I just saw all the connections. Um, so one of the things we did is we went to, um, Spelman Morehouse in Clark Atlanta, um, all, uh, BSU, uh, colleges, uh, historic black colleges. And, um, we, I said BSU, historic black colleges, sorry, (laughs) historic black colleges. Anyways, we went there and, um, I thought it was just an amazing experience to see the like rich history and like the accomplishments and everything that kind of went into forming those places and what role they had in the civil rights movement. But I also felt like, again, once a time, like a few times in my life, I have felt like a minority. And on that campus, I did feel like a minority. And that was, I don't know if it was an uncomfortable experience for me, but it was a different experience to me. And I thought back to how long in my life did I live before I was ever a minority anywhere? And I thought, wow, I think that's like really powerful. Um, and we got to talk to a uh, LHS grad, a student from there, some other young ladies that attended um, Spelman, and just heard about their experiences. Just, you know, Jasmine, our student that we spoke to, talking about what Libreville was like and compared to like going to Spelman. And um, she said some really, really powerful things. And so just connecting with those students was, was amazing. And just as a social worker, trying to um, relate to my students and help understand maybe where they're coming from. I thought it was very powerful. Um, Another stop that we had was we went to the National Voting Rights Museum in Selma, right at the foot of the Selma uh, Bridge or the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So we went there and we met this man named Sam Walker. And, you know, we could see Sam maybe um, do a a video, I guess, or watch it, see him in a documentary, but being with him and hearing what he had to say and meeting someone who um, has, who walked over the bridge that day um, was pretty amazing. And we all didn't know that right when we got there, but then when we had the time to, an opportunity to ask questions, I said like, well, what's your connection to this? And he said, when he was 11 years old, um, he was a foot soldier. And I never knew that so many young children were involved in the civil rights movement because if they left, uh, you know, high school or elementary school to walk across the bridge, they weren't going to lose their jobs. Whereas their parents, if they left work and were doing something like that, they could potentially um, face some really intense retaliation and lose their jobs and not be able to provide for their family. So that was a really, really cool portion of that. Um, And then this is Sean Woody. Um, He is one of our social social studies teacher, and he is uh, teaching African-American studies next year. And this is what he had to say about the trip. This trip has been transformative for me. This trip has been transformative for me. Uh, I've always enjoyed studying civil rights. I've always studied civil rights history. It's always been a part of my study of history. But this trip has really changed the way I think about civil rights, especially as a my commitment, what I can do to try to make the world better. Uh, at the Peace and Justice Center, on the way out of the center, there was a plaque that talked about commitment, commitment to the beloved community that we're trying to build. And because of this trip, I think my sense of commitment has grown. My sense of commitment to equality and justice have grown. I used to think it was, you know, it was not much I can do as one individual, but that has changed. And now I think with my work and the work of others that we can try to work towards obtaining that beloved community that Dr. King so often talked about. Again, this trip has been transformative and I'm so glad that I came on the civil rights team. Thank you. John was using a, this- a- John was using a strategy that all of our tour participants uh, engage in as we're traveling. Um, We asked them to think about the phrase, I used to think 
but now I think to describe the transformations they experience. That's a strategy that some of our teachers use with students in classes as well. And so while we're traveling, we're always trying to model um, those experiences and opportunities for our educators to engage in that way with their students as well. Um, this is the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. Um, Rachel Campbell, an English teacher from Vernon Hills is pictured here with Tiffany Scott, uh, as well as a, a line of our educators. This picture here um, was an experience that I think none of us will forget. We sat at a lunch counter and you see we placed our hands on the counter. And as we did so, we heard uh, what happened to those who participated in sit-ins as angry mobs approached them, hit the backs of their chairs, dragged them out of their chairs and uh, hauled them off to jail um, or, uh, and or harmed them physically during the process. It was an incredible transformational experience to be present at that lunch counter and to imagine the courage of those young students who sat to integrate lunch counters in the South. Rachel Campbell talks about um, her experience. She said, in our English class, we often use the analogy of mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors by Rudine Sim Bishop with our students when they approach text. Books that are mirrors reflect your own identity back to you, and windows give you a view of others. Immersive learning for me is a sliding glass door. You don't just get a view that helps you learn and understand. You stepped into the place to more deeply think, feel, and experience in a way you can't otherwise. In Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Kelly Angelo joined our trip in a very nimble way. One of our uh, participants was scheduled to attend and at the last minute her um, family uh, experienced COVID. And so she could not travel with us. On the day before the trip, we arranged for Kelly at her, she volunteered and said she could make it happen. And I made it happen with the company and, and Kelly uh, joined us that very next day. Kelly described immersive learning in this way. Immersive learning offers too many opportunities for me to capture here, but it mirrors the values we already know in building professional learning communities that then improve student learning and grow professional capacity. The immersive learning specifically creates a shared purpose and experience that builds trust, communication, knowledge, collaboration, and belonging, which improves collegial relationships, school culture, and personal connection to the district, which ultimately benefits student success. <laughs> up there that you can read it's very long um but really it's the what will what will we do next and the whole purpose of this um for me to go on this trip was designing a trip like this for students because like we said like i said i think that they need to like see it feel it touch it be in it to kind of under to to understand it so as we move forward um what does that look like and i think that's kind of you know why we're here is to try and figure that out but our hope is that this opportunity is provided to um, as many students as we can possibly offer it to and provide to students that despite financial uh, or socioeconomic status are able to go on this trip as well as kids from all different, you know, different types of learners. If that's EL learners, if that's students within the special ed, uh, special services department, I just really want to provide that experience for all students and um, give them what we have found so valuable from these trips. My turn. Uh, I'm Brian Voss from Libertyville um, and kind of continue this conversation about the impact of how we improve not only um, my teaching as a teacher with my students, but also the student engagement piece. Um, I'm going to share a couple of quotes as well as kind of my mission in all of this. Um, so as a social studies teacher, um, regardless of whatever I teach, I feel like it, it is in my core uh, to teach and get students to become civically engaged in this really complex world, especially right now. Uh, and it's through that work of being civically engaged, it is about understanding and learning and hearing and experiencing different stories of others. Uh, before we come to a judgment or a conclusion, we have to seek to understand. Um, and these experiences and these immersive opportunities 
allow for me and students to really get a chance to pause for a moment and just hear other people's perspectives, other stories, other insights, and put that on the hopper to really understand where they're coming from. Um, this picture up here, uh, the beauty of this trip is, yes, it's about civil rights in the United States and in the South, um, but this final uh, stop in Atlanta was the Center for um, Civil Liberties and Human Rights. Part of the museum is looking at American history and civil rights uh, and equality, then the other part is in the world. So it's a kind of a conclusion to this whole trip of we've just experienced a very personal local one of the United States. And now let's look at what else is happening beyond our borders. So this was a really quick informal picture taken by Kelly Angelos uh, standing in front of a display with Tank Man. And I, this picture really strikes me in so many levels of immersive learning because uh, a few of you at the table might remember a trip to China in the before time of another experience, uh, experience trip with students. Um, where we just learned about the culture, met with students and had a overnight stay. And one part of that trip was going to Tiananmen Square to understand Tiananmen Square. And for me, it was trying to find the tank man spot. Uh, and here I am in Tiananmen Square on my phone, on Yahoo, trying to figure out where's tank man. And I learned really quick that that is not culturally appropriate as my phone shut down and was wiped all trying to find where that spot was. We see that picture all the time in textbooks, but until you get to those locations, you hear the locals talking about their stories. That's a lasting memory. And it's changed my perspective of in that one moment in China and Tiananmen Square, bringing it back to the civil rights tour. I think about, again, that civic engagement, just that the things you learn about, like, um, like the GI bill and the impact of the GI bill and who, was able to get funds and who weren't. So imagine for a moment, see, you can imagine it until you're actually there on a bus between Montgomery and Selma. Uh, and you're looking out the windows and you just see gorgeous landscape everywhere. And then your mind begins to wonder and you have these conversations. There's so much land, so much opportunity. And you're in a state that doesn't have infrastructure. My economics mind is going, trying to figure out why. And then as you hear the stories and talk to people and see the potential, you begin to realize the impact of the past, which has on today, just from looking out the window and just wondering what you see. So it's very powerful moments of just to hear those different stories. The next slide, Bo, uh, takes us to two other teachers talking about their experience. So uh, on the left, uh, Rachel Campbell is once again talking about uh, and expressing her learning, bringing it back to her students about the importance of storytelling and the importance in English of knowing those stories. So I'm going to read not the full one, but just part of her quote. Uh, Something we don't often discuss are the traditional roots of storytelling. And through this immersive experience, I gathered more knowledge about how African traditions of storytelling carried into slavery to Jim Crow, to civil rights, to now. I was inspired to work on a curriculum project that would better expose students to different cultures, telling storytelling traditions and how storytelling is vital to carry on cultural values and traditions. And I think that's at the core of what we do as teachers is to realize that it's not only about learning and knowing those facts, but it's also about that cultural norm of how you learn. Because how you learn begins to better understand how you work with others and hear those stories. So that quote really stood out to me as I um, think about what Rachel said. And then the other one over there from Nancy Harmon, who teaches uh, PE at Vernon Hills, uh, and in that PE curriculum, just looking at current events, our students are exposed to these all the time, even in PE, and finding ways to bring in that common narrative of, I used to think, but now I think, as a model to create some sort of communal way to reflect and to post and to share what the learning is and the model that learning is always happening all the time. And from this trip, she's bringing this into her PE class and finding ways uh, to help students understand all of those different stories. And I believe on our final slide of this part that I have uh, is Jeremy Little. Uh, again, a discipline that you wouldn't traditionally think being impacted by a trip like this. Uh, and you're going to hear a little bit about what he's doing now in his music classes. Hello, District 128 School Board. Uh, this is Jeremy Little, a uh, choir teacher at Vernon Hills High School. I just want to say thank you very much for your supporting of the civil rights uh, faculty trip. It was a transformational experience for me to experience those sites and places and 
uh, relatives of people and people who were very much affected uh, by the civil rights movement. Uh, in the spring of 2023, the choirs will be re researching and performing songs of hope and resilience and resistance that were born out of the civil rights movement. And uh, I look forward to delving into those difficult topics uh, with the information and experiences that I have, as well as bringing in lots of other voices to the conversation. Thank you for supporting this uh, valuable work, and uh, we really appreciate it here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in Montgomery, we also were able to visit um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It's often, and this is something I learned, it's often referred to as like the lynching museum, which is what, you know, I thought going into it. But quickly when you arrive there, you realize that's not the name for it. Um, instead, it's really this message of how we create um, peace and how we create justice and how we honor those um, who, who have lost their lives, right, um, seeking equality um, and justice. And there's a memorial in I've traveled around the world seeing memorials. This is by far the most impactful memorial I've been to. Um, it is similar to the one in Berlin. Actually, the artist modeled it um, off of the Holocaust Museum that's in Berlin, which a, a group of us have also visited. Um, and it on each of the um, columns, you'll see a state and then names of those who have, who were lynched. Um, and it's really kind of walking through this path of just seeing um, the magnitude of those who were affected by this. Um, so Joey Regan was also on the trip and he talked about, I do not want to isolate the struggles of marginalized populations into separate units, but to constantly weave these challenges into the fabric of each era of history being studied. I would also like to ensure that curriculum materials are reflective on the broader student population, not just through the lens of the traditional dominant perspective. Um, and that's something that really speaks to me um, for, you know, the, the first trip in Berlin that, that Sarah Greenswag and I developed the American Studies curriculum is we focused on hidden voices and to see again that theme as we traveled through the civil rights, um, you know, trip here in this country. Again, we saw the power of the hidden voices and elevating um, those people. So, in Montgomery, connected to that museum or that memorial is the Legacy Museum. And this is a newer museum and very interactive. Um, when you walk in, it actually takes you through a journey of enslavement and the story um, of Africa to present day and incarceration. Um, and it's put together by the Equal Justice Initiative and Brian Stevenson, if you're familiar with him in Just Mercy. Um, and this museum was so powerful. We, we all walked away just, how can we bring our students here? How can we get them to walk this journey with us and really see the things that we teach so often in the class, but really like feel them and be, um, you know, really inspired by them. So what I think is interesting too is the power of this place. So just um, last week, Thursday, I was passing out shirts for student council and a junior boy came up to the table to get his t-shirt and he had a Just Mercy shirt on. And I didn't know this student. And I said, wow, I love your shirt you know, did, I was just at the Legacy Museum. Did you get it there? And he's like, yes, because they sell them in, in the store there. Um, and he's like, yes, I was there. My grandparents live in Montgomery and I was there last weekend. And um, I'm like, oh, did you go, you know, to the, the memorial? And he's like, yes, it was so amazing. And then he said to me, he goes, all students should visit these places. So that's all we need to say. But, um, but I should have, but, and I was so caught up in that. We were talking so much about it and he was so inspired, this 17 year old student right here at Vernon Hills. And I said, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get all students to experience this. And he was so excited about that. Um, and I just think about that opportunity. You know, I, I live in Libertyville. My three children are going to be going to Libertyville High School soon. Um, and I think about the opportunity that I would want for them. And just to hear, you know, this random student who I didn't get his name, but I'm going to track him down, John. So you're going to help me. Um, but him to just say, like, all students should also experience this, um, which is really just speaks to the power of going to these places. Hello. 
Um, this slide will show you another um, portion of the National Voter Rights Museum. And um, part of the things that we were able to see there were actual artifacts. Uh, you know, you can, you can read about separate drinking fountains or separate bathrooms and segregated lunch counters, but these were exhibits of like actual things from those horrible experiences. So we were able to walk through that. Um, this is Tara Young, who was an English teacher at Vernon Hills, um, who took, took the opportunity during, during one of the, um, the brief moments she had to just sit down and, and write about what she was going to do with the things she had experienced and how it was going to transform her classrooms. Um, she says, place-based learning has completely transformed my teaching practices in ways that really benefit students. My two experiences with immersive professional learning have transformed my lessons, my instruction, my assessment. The impact is wide reaching. And this is our group at the birth home of Martin Luther King, which as many people have said, you can see all this in a textbook. You can look it up online, but to actually be there with our amazing ranger guy, Bruce Lee, uh, he took us through and just told us, I mean, you were standing in the rooms where Martin Luther King grew up and told us funny stories about him and the, like the mischief he would get into with his brother. And, um, he knew people, um, that, you know, just famous people that had come through the house and just had been, they had just reopened since co closing during COVID, like I think a week before we were there. So they were just the energy to tell the stories. And part of my role in being able to go on this trip and the Berlin trip is to tell the story of the, the educators who are there that are going to bring this back to the students and hopefully get students to also take advantage of these opportunities. So I've just had an amazing time giving them, giving all of them the opportunity to just do their experience while I follow them around and take the photos and get the video and um, be able to share those. So um, the plan is to put a web, web page together so that we can kind of house all this information and share it with um, future teachers, new teachers, and students that um, can have these experiences as well. Picture shows Amy Christian, who's not here tonight, and uh, Brian, who is taking another opportunity to reflect, to journal, to think about how uh, the, the experience transformed them. Uh, this marker is outside the 16th Street Baptist Church for the four young girls who uh, perished during the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, being in that place and hearing their stories um, was something that um, most of us will not ever forget. Um, speaking for myself, I will never forget. Um, and others have said the same, a very transformational experience. Um, Amy, in fact, was able to use this experience almost immediately in a discussion with her classes. She said, this trip has already given me examples to loop into day-to-day conversations with students to help them see the through line from the past to the present. Following the mass shooting in Buffalo, I was moved to talk with my students about another incident of racial terror, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. I told my students that story and discussed ways that communities can respond to hate crimes. I shared the story of the Wales window and showed the pictures I took while in Birmingham. My goal going forward is to not let the teachable moments for connecting past events to each other or past events to the present, especially as they relate to civil rights, to slip by. This slide um, features Paul Friedrich, um, who uh, teaches at Vernon Hills and is an amazing educator. He taught us all while on the trip as well on the bus. His comment uh, while we're riding the bus into uh, Alabama that was shared with our group made us all pause. Um, we learned about the Freedom Riders whose buses were attacked and burned as they traveled through the South to register voters and to conduct freedom schools. He said, let us not take for granted that we can take for granted what the Freedom Riders could not. And uh, 
to me, that that really speaks to the the long term and lasting impact of this, the understanding of how our lives differ from others um, and the impact that that can have. Paul's going to tell you his own story and how he's going to use this experience in this video. I used to think that uh, teaching hard history was important. Now I think it should be mandatory. And I think it's not enough just to teach it. And this trip really emphasized for me the importance of, of doing it, of being there, of living it, and understanding that it is in many ways not really history, that it's still happening now. And to immerse ourselves in the present tense nature of it really emphasized how important teaching that struggle is and how important it is to recognize that history more in our country. We, we, we don't confront it enough. I think confronting it is, is mandatory. This video um, from Madeline Powell, again, emphasizes the importance of the trip. Madeline is a team leader at Vernon Hills High School. I feel well, incredibly blessed to have been able to go on the um, civil rights tour. A few years ago, I was able to go on the Berlin trip. And as a result of going on that trip and seeing how Germany handled um, their remembrance and reflection of the Holocaust, I felt like there would be power in our students being able to see how this country um, handled a period in our history that is clearly a dark period um, with students being killed and people being killed based solely on the color of their skin, not the content of their character or crimes that they committed, but solely because they were African-American. And so being able to go on this tour, I thought, wow, it's going to be an incredibly powerful experience and give me the opportunity to kind of um, interact with that, with that information firsthand. But it reminded me more so that we have a charge as educators to ensure that our students understand that they have the ability to make change. So when they see injustice, they have the power to go out and confront that and to be an advocate for those who can't be an advocate for themselves. And so when I think back to the Black Lives Matter March in Vernon Hills, it was organized by a group of Vernon Hills former students who took that charge on and said, we are going to make a difference, that we are going to be heard, that we are not going to allow this to go and just sweep it under the rug. And so I am reminded as an educator to make sure that um, I empower my students in the future when we have those conversations, when they see injustice, to go out and make a difference, that their voice matters, um, whether that's with race, whether that's with gender, whatever it is, their voice matters. I... So to conclude our presentation, uh, I want to take us back to um, the, the original purpose of this trip for our, our participants, uh, Madeline, that you just met, and Liz, who's here with us tonight. How can we, how might we, is another question we ask when we're designing, how might we ensure that students are empowered with voice and choice and experiences like these? Um, research has shown that project-based learning um, supports increased student achievement and equity by doing just that, by empowering student voice, choice, and agency, uh, their sense of academic identity. So through these experiences, our adults are learning to plan projects for students. And one of those projects is a trip that you'll hear more about as we finalize the planning for it during the next school year, hopefully connected to the African American Studies course, which is new for next year, and will be taught by Sean Witte, who um, felt very privileged uh, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church to uh, stand at the podium that Martin Luther King preached from and uh, to think about how he might teach this course to students in the future. He's also on the bus after the Morehouse tour. Morehouse is an all-male school and Spelman is an all-female school. Uh, Sean 
uh, told those of us who uh, were unable to go to Morehouse, the story of Morehouse and everything that they had seen. So we look forward to Sean's efforts in the, the class. And we thank you again um, for this opportunity. And we apologize for taking more time than we had intended. But uh, being the nimble educators we are in this busy time, we, we pulled this together at the last minute and didn't do a run through. So, <laughs> so thank you for your time and for the support of these experiences. Thanks. Thank you. The board is very grateful for that uh, thorough recap of your trip. And I feel that I do an apology to the students and their families who came for the student uh, board rep transitions. It would have been uh, clever of me to do that first um, and then hear the educational presentation. So I apologize to all of you that have been waiting for the student board reports and uh, the recognition of our outgoing uh, members, as well as for um, recognizing our incoming uh, members, but um, we we are very uh, pleased that um, the trip was so impactful. Um, we are very grateful for that recap. And um, do any of the board members have any comments that they wanted to share? Or any questions? Okay. Then, uh, without further ado, um, we will move on <coughs> to our. Um, student uh, school board reports. I think we will um, start with your reports and then uh, we'll have some recognition for you. Perfect. Okay. I'll start for Vernon Hills. So VHHS has had a busy month of May with award ceremonies, AP tests, and now finals coming up. For two weeks, our, best, our bell schedule was suspended to make accommodation for the daily AP exams. Even with the COVID-19 surge catching on to some of our student body, those students were able to retake their missed exams for the same amount of time allowed this past week. There seemed to be sufficient room to fill any class size and students with extended time needs were able to test in separate rooms to prevent distraction. Another end of the year policy that has been the, has been the new no phone slash mandatory bathroom pass policy. It was stated that students must need a pass to go out of class anytime and they are not allowed to bring their phones when they do so. This rule was met with a lot of negative feedback from the student body, which I guess is expected seeing as how most of us can't really spend a minute away from our phones. However, seniors argue that the policy takes a step back towards middle school by controlling us when we need to go to the bathroom. One senior said that if high school prepares us for independence in the future, we should be able to do this without being monitored so closely. There seems to be mixed feelings over the policy between staff, but as of now, most students are asking for passes respectfully and using their teachers' phone jails when they need to. The final Cougar Class Act ceremony was celebrated last Wednesday, where many Cougars were recognized for their outstanding achievements. Specific staff members chose multiple students, like Mrs. Schwartz, who nominated the whole ARC Tutoring Executive Board for their hard work in getting special programs like the SAT Tutoring and ARC in the Dark rolling this year. Also, for the first time in Cougar Class Act Award history, a student got nominated twice in the same month. This was the amazing Syra Alavi, nominated by Ms. Zabo for her excellent leadership in Muslim Student Association, and I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, but Mrs. Franchi, Franchi um, for her dedication, hard work, and optimism towards her badminton team. Another very honorable recipient was Ruslana Berkholian who made sure to write individual notes for Ukrainian victims when our school was having a drive and became a very big helper in that movement for VHHS. All of these students are very inspiring and we can't wait to have their picture hung on the wall all summer. Congrats specifically to Katie Goldstone, Syra Alavi, Avery Kamai, Alyssa Waitsman, Addison Kaiser, Isabella Ramos, um, Grace Gilliam, William Angelos, um, Alan Sagalov, Sophia Rose, Sophia Gonzalez Bernier, Mm -hmm. Nolan Laser, Kaylee Irvin, Alyssa Choi, Sasha Agafanova, Hayden Graham, Jonah Hansen, Samantha McCraney, Ruslana Verkoliad, Elizabeth Kalika, and Allison Clemstein. Now, congratulations to our VHHS Wind Ensemble for, v for being the 2022 Super State Champions. It's been quite a while since the group got that honor, specifically since 2013, so this was huge for the school. The band and orchestra departments also have been having their last concerts of the year, full of senior awards, tributes, and special solos. Josh Kalinowski was able to do the senior solo for band, while Adam Brand will be performing it for the orchestra. Congrats to these amazing musicians. Our theater department also had a fun end to the year, 
with a production of Almost Maine. The cast and crew had a great time putting this production together as the last one for the class of 2022. And the whole post-prom COVID surge did unfortunately get a hold of one of our performers. But thankfully, senior Ashley Levy was able to step in on a day's notice and do an excellent job with the role. The Orcas' dance company got to perform their show Flourish, and it was a hit. With various combinations of lyrical, hip-hop, contemporary, and even some tap among other categories, it was a very entertaining show to watch. Students took in their favorite songs and choreographed their own dances over the course of the semester. I specifically enjoyed Alyssa Choi's heartbreaking choreographed number, raising awareness about eating disorders. However, fun dances like the musical theater medley were also fan favorites. To end the year with a bang, the Fine Arts Department hosted its first in-person Arts in Action event since 2018. I'd never attended one of these, and I will say it was the coolest arts event of my whole high school career. Not only students came to support each other's talents, but parents, staff, and members of the community came to cheer everyone on. There was student art displayed all over the foyer, which was very diverse and eccentric in its own way. It ranged from Elena Revinskaya's painted portraits, to Maya Salwa's intriguing photography, to even Haley Rootberg's hanging outdoor glass sculptures. I really enjoyed seeing how talented my peers are and how the school offers enough resources for them to excel in making their art. Student singers and musicians performed on the stage during the event, like Neil Mehta singing a song from his own written album, to Megan Rakers bringing her family band on the stage to sing Celine Dion. Students then got to watch the student-directed one-act plays, Orcasis, and Improv Club perform their own acts before the a cappella concert to top the night off. By the end of the night, the studio theater was jam-packed with all kinds of people, and the energy was through the roof. Student a cappella groups Love Notes and Voicemail got to perform their set, which has been completely student-run for the whole semester. The crowds went wild, and it was such a satisfying feeling for my last high school performance. I have to say that this school has provided me with so many great opportunities as a fine arts student, and I'm looking at how much I'm looking at how much fun I have been able to have at the end of the year doing what I love, and it's a very satisfying feeling. So thank you. Um, this last Wednesday, we had our decision day, and the West Gym was filled with balloons and decorations for all the seniors to take pictures with their friends. We also had our map where all the seniors put a dot of where, were they, of where they will be attending school next year. It was a bittersweet moment seeing how far apart everyone would be, but at the same time, we were able to celebrate each other's hard work. This morning, we also had our senior breakfast and honors assembly. It was a cool moment to see everyone all dressed up and coming together as a class. Also, being able to see how much our class has accomplished these past four years was really cool and something that we'll all remember forever. The senior video was really sentimental to all of us, and it meant a lot. And as a fun way to close off the year, the seniors have been participating in their own game of Senior Assassin. The game started about a month ago with over 100 people participating. The rules started with everyone being able to wear goggles or floaties as protection from the water guns and having school, sports, and work as a safe space. These locations remain safe, but now no protection is allowed and anyone can get anyone out. Uh, as the game comes to an end soon, with less than 10 people remaining, it's definitely been a fun way to end the year as a class because it's something that we all did together. Yesterday, we had our carne asada event, which is a barbecue hosted by the Chicos and Chicas groups and the Latin American Student Organization. Many people attended this event, including current students, alum, incoming students, and families. This gave the incoming freshmen an opportunity to talk with teachers and current students, and it was a really welcoming event for them. The day was filled with tons of food and activities like spike ball, musical chairs, pinatas, face painting, and a lot of prizes. Many of my friends have attended a lot of the Chico's meetings throughout the year, and they said that this was a super fun way for them to end the year with their friends and family and have one last event together. Daniel Prieto, a senior, said the event was very successful, and he had so much fun celebrating and spending time with his friends. The apes and earth science classes have been working together to build a native plant garden. In 2019, right before COVID hit, Mr. McCarty and Ms. Clark applied to get Vernon Hills as a certified wildlife habitat from the National Wildlife Federation. But because of COVID, the school unfortunately never got to work on it. But now that we're back, the school is able to put in an order for new plants. And this just came in on Friday. And so the school ordered from the organization and they send plants based on what we want and also what our environment is like, such as sunlight and temperature. And so we are actually also the first school to ever order plants from this organization. And the students are really excited about this and they've been working hard. <laughs> and digging in the garden, planting the plants, and putting out decorations like bird baths and butterfly baths. And on April 23rd and 24th, Vernon Hills JSA went to the Chicago 
for the annual Spring State, Spring State Convention. The delegates debated, took part in activism activities, heard from a student leadership panel, and enjoyed fun activities. They also debated global politics and humanitarian issues and took part in an impromptu debate tournament discussing the necessity of NATO. Overall, the students had a lot of fun and really enjoyed this unique experience. Also at the convention, Ariel Schifrin was elected as Midwest governor, and he will work to help plan conventions, support the local chapter, and rebuild the organization post-pandemic. All right, here we go. Uh, this year, we have four teachers retiring from VHHS. The retirees include uh, Ms. Dirks, uh, Mrs. Ms. Fernbach, Ms. Nardini, and Mr. Zabelli. Uh, I'm going to give a quick personal shout out to Mr. Zabelli. He was my freshman and Bible lit teacher, and he is absolutely amazing at his job. Um, in addition, the fact that he prioritizes the connection with the students, even after they're outside of the classroom, is just fantastic. And I was able to make a personal connection, and I have been invited to his house when he retires. So that's awesome. And it's great that he just keeps those like connections with, uh, with the students even past college. Uh, VHHS wishes all four of these teachers the best of luck in their retirement. And we will, we will be missing them in the halls. Last week, uh, the last week of April, our school had uh, Bring Your Child to Work Day. Teachers were able to bring their children into the school. Um, and basically every single period, different activities uh, were given to these uh, students, or these ch children, sorry. Uh, seniors and other students uh, with, with the period off were able to meet, talk, help, and guide these children with whatever activities there were. My personal favorite was the... Uh, time they're in the foyer and the pep band was basically trying to teach us the cougar fight song and they just didn't know it and they kept trying and trying and they just could never get it it was amazing to watch it was because they're so little it's so funny <laughs> um <laughs> overall seeing these little kids roaming around the halls all day was just exciting for all students all right for athletics we have a lot i will apologize right now for all the names i'm about to butcher um so track athletes uh went down state for the girls uh Jenna Cody, Nicole, Nicole Spytek, Kylie Spytek, and Ava Lukian placed 13th in the 4x100-meter. Uh, um, Erica Bunning placed 27th in pole vault and 17th in discus. Livy Tron placed 32nd in long jump. Rachel Afulike placed 19th in shot put, and Kylie Spytek placed 15th in the 200-meter. Badminton also had two people going down to state. So congratulations to Neha Kum Kumarani and uh, Anaga Sharisha. Again, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, the boys track team just had their sectionals and had a couple people make it down to state. Congratulations to Cam Martin, Jake Slavish, Ryan Kaczynski, and uh, Sean Kulu, who um, are competing in the 4 by 200 Glenn McGowan, who um, will be competing in the 300-meter hurdles, Nate Lee for shot put, and, and David Munn for discus and shot put. Uh, congratulations to Ronit Dasha Parata, um, Arush Vora, Aditya uh, Sabriuhal, uh, Andrew Tikhanov, Tony Pomeranitz, and Dan uh, Daniel Shevbelov um, for, uh, for making it down to state for tennis. Um, the girls' soccer team had a great season, but sadly lost to Wakanda for, I think, for like the fourth time in a row um, in the regional finals yesterday, or sorry, last weekend. Um, the boys' baseball team won the CSL North for the first time ever in school history and are going to the regionals uh, uh, this Thursday. Uh, the Special Olympic State, um, uh, for uh, they made it down to state for soccer. Uh, congratulations to uh, Alexa uh, Donato. Uh, Libby Carton, Hayden Johns, Mackenzie Runke, uh, Joseph Mahler, Chris uh, Morrison, Chase Miller, Noah Hewitt, um, Hazel Morals, Alibana Giza, uh, Javi, and uh, Danielle uh, Granados. Again, I'm so sorry for these names. They're pretty bad. Um, in addition, uh, the Special Olympic track team had athletes to also make it down to state. Uh, congratulations to Haley Dunbar, who placed uh, gold in the 200 and bronze in the 100. Uh, ha Hannah Kier uh, Kierstis, uh, who placed uh, gold in the 200 and the 50. Noah Hewitt, who placed gold in the 100 uh, and fourth in the 200. J 
Joseph Mahler, who plays gold in the 100 and silver in the 200. Uh, Chris Morrison, who plays gold in the 200 and bronze in the 100. Uh, Luke Bard- Bardwell, who plays gold in the 200 and fourth in the f- uh, 50. Joel Smith, who plays, plays silver silver in the 200 and fifth in the 50. And Mackenzie Runke, who plays f- uh, gold in the 400. All right. All right, just a heads up from the new student board reps. These reports are usually not that long, so <laughs> just the last one. We're just trying to milk the clock, so they get to see more of us. So. All right, the end of the school year is upon us, and the Wildcats are buzzing with excitement for a well-deserved summer break. Within the excitement, there is, or at least I hope there is, a hint of sadness at the impending graduation of an amazing senior class. Truly one of the best, our community, togetherness, and school pride was only enriched by the difficult circumstances of the pandemic. And if you ask Dr. K or any other Libertyville faculty member, I know they they will say the same thing. We made the most of the circumstance and our legacy will leave a lasting impression on Libertyville High School. But enough bragging about uh, our fantastic class. This past weekend was Libertyville's prom. A testament to our lively student body and spectacular faculty, an all-time record number of tickets were sold. Around 750 juniors and seniors Again, I don't want to brag, but that might be double, I think, what Vernon Hills had. Close to. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not a competition. Went to Rosemont for an unbelievable night of dancing and fun. The words I most commonly heard described the prom were, too fun. A huge shout out to student council and all the advisors who orchestrated transportation, food, and all the other logistics. Students left to dance soaking wet, myself included. Asked Dr. K, I should have gave him a hug. <laughs> From dancing the night away. Moving on, earlier this spring, many LHS teachers created and signed a petition that called for stricter rules on student cell phone use, citing the noticeable increase in their classrooms. Again, as Vernon Hills is trying to address the problem, last week, Dr. K hosted like a student forum during their lunches to discuss uh, how students feel about the, uh, how to move forward with the cell phone policy. Uh, teachers are advocating for them to be away, or at least most are advocating for them to be away at all times in the classroom which obviously does not sit well with every student. An array of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors attended to voice their opinions on the problems. As one of the attendees, I heard arguments from it, teaches students discipline by letting them decide whether or not to pay attention or get distracted by their phones, to students need to have them taken away because they often don't make choices in their best self-interest. I fell on that side. Well, I believe our students are very bright. We are just teenagers and tend to do, or tend to be distracted and not do the thing that's best for us, so. Regardless, Dr. K heard a whole spectrum of arguments, and hopefully we'll take the students' thoughts into consideration when reforming the policy next year. I also quickly want to mention that uh, Libertyville had a solar panel project that students from Leith and Echos were working on, or Ecos are working on. Last Thursday, students, along with Dr. K and Mr. Stancil, built the frame for these solar panels, and the rest, like setting it up, will be done shortly uh, in the next coming weeks. Next. I wanted to highlight the exceptional staff that Liberty will be losing to retirement next year. Mr. Goodwin, Mrs. Belstra, Mr. Mix, and Mr. Lapish. Well, I did not have the pleasure of having all of them as teachers. I worked with Ms., uh, Mrs. Belstra as she's our CS- CRC, uh, the head of the CRC, and Mr. Lapish and Mr. Mix. So I'd like to talk about them for a quick second. First, Mr. Lapish. He devotes more hours to his club leaf than any other advisor does. And he almost single-handedly created our beautiful courtyard and he runs our recycling program. He holds Brownie Fridays every other Friday for all former students to swing by his classroom and get a treat and spends his time during passing periods throwing around a ball to students in the hallway. He truly just loves catching up with his students and making them feel like they can always come and talk to him about anything. He epitomizes a teacher that truly cares for his students. Much like Mr. Lapish, I also had the pleasure of having Mr. Mix in class and boy, is he going to be missed. Beyond his impact, just teaching geography, and coaching basketball and badminton, the person as he is will be missed more than any of that. Students past and present fill his classroom every day during passing periods to chat with him. He offers all students who pass his class access to his closet of treats. If you're randomly to go into his classroom at any time during a passing period, whether he had a class in or not, it would be full of students just chatting with him as he loves to have them and he engages with them on a daily basis. I'm one of those students. I always come in and I don't even get treats anymore. I just like to talk with him. So... <laughs> Uh, with uh, those, all those faculty members change lives of the students at Libertyville, and they will be dearly missed. And now I'm going to pass it on to Ryan. 
John, you did an excellent job. I want to add Miss um, Thumb and Mr. Regner oh. and Miss Masha are also retiring. Sorry so about that. I did not get the full load down. No problem. You did a great job. Okay. The Spring Sports Awards were held last Wednesday in honor of our many spring sports finishing up their seasons or entering their postseasons. Our athletes and teams have had a lot of success so far in competition. So here are just a few recent highlights. Last Friday, girls soccer just won the regional championship in a game that I will say was very exciting to watch, but also very, very nerve wracking. Um, in boys tennis, Connor Stelter and Wills Warren uh, won the sectionals double title and made it down state. And then in the, the girls and boys track teams both competed in sectionals these past couple of weeks, and both teams had a state qualifier, Anna Becker in triple jump and Ali Fayez in the mile. Congrats to both of them and to all of our spring sports on their many accomplishments. Tonight is also a big night. Boys volleyball and the boys and girls across teams are currently playing in a playoff game. So good luck to them. On May 4th, the CRC held a decision day celebration for seniors, complete with a photo station, music, snacks, which I know were very much appreciated, and a map where each senior could pin where they were going next year. The Midwest is definitely very popular, but we do have students that will be traveling all over the country, some even going abroad to Canada, Ireland, and France. The celebrations were super fun and a great way to celebrate our future paths. Seniors had an opportunity to, to participate either during the Wednesday flex time or during their lunch period, and everyone I talked to just had a really great time. Thank you to the CRC and all the parent volunteers for this amazing event. AP tests took place the first two weeks of May, with makeup exams being administered the past couple weeks. These makeup exams are being used more this year than typical, um, because a lot of students who tested po positive for COVID were unable to attend the original in-person tests. The majority of the tests took place in the new multi-purpose room, which according to students was a much better testing environment than the gym, which they were used to in the past. Specifically, AP language classes have a recording that must be played for the listening section of the test. And there are a lot of complaints last year from students who struggled to hear the audio in the gym. Uh, this year, the issue was solved and students were able to hear the recordings without issue in the multipurpose room and in the other locations. The LHS Orcasis show, Rebound, was held last Thursday and Friday. Orcasis is a dance show where students are able to choreograph pieces in a variety of different styles, and the rest of the Orcasis company members perform those pieces. It's a really cool way for students to be able to create their own choreography and show it off to an audience. I participated in this year's shows, and it really felt amazing to be back in front of a crowd in person rather than virtual as the shows were the past couple of years. I'm always amazed at the ability of my friends and classmates to create such amazing dance pieces, and it's such a great opportunity to be able to do that through the school and perform it on stage. The crowd seemed equally amazed and definitely gave us a very enthusiastic reaction. Overall, it was a huge success, so thank you to all the dancers, directors, um, and sound and stage managers who helped to make that happen. I'll pass it off to Faith. As we come to the close of an amazing school year where we went through struggles and triumphs with COVID, moments where we came together to make a project even better within our district and saw the growth of our events that they had throughout the year while trying to conquer a pandemic. We now um, take a breath to look at the outcome this all had. On May 12th and 13th, we're going to start off. Alec just had an art show, and that displayed all our art students' work that they wanted to see in our annual art show. Um, these pieces were amazing. They weren't only drawn, but they were painted, made out of clay, glass, jewelry. It's, it was like crazy how much um, the creativity these students really had. The whole school was able to stop by at a point in the day and look around to admire all the crazy talent we have within our artistic students at LHS. When one of my class or one of my classes went to visit the art show, the pieces not only showed crazy ability, but different viewpoints on things and creativity of topics going around in the world right now. One of my favorites, I don't remember the artist's name, but it was a piece about mixed media and the way it affects our society. And I thought that was so cool how he took something that can definitely be talked about for hours on end and put that in his art. I thought that was awesome. Next up, we had the class of 22 uh, awards celebration on May 17th. With this event, we can take a moment to acknowledge our seniors who have worked their whole high school career and um, really put in the effort to um, show leadership and um, their following of the daring mission. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the ceremony, but I received a principal leadership award 
and was told about all the amazing scholarships students were given for their hard work. The spring choir concert was May 19th, which I also participated in. And coming in uh, from a student that's been in choir all four years of high school, this concert was actually very emotional for me. And um, I'm an ugly crier, just so you know. But um, (laughs) I doubt that. Oh, (laughs) Dr. Brown is hands down one of the closest teachers I've had all throughout high school. And um, having one last time to sing with one and some of my best friends and um, such a role model and amazing person was insane to say the least it, it was definitely a eye-opening experience to say like oh my gosh it was a, it was a really great concert <laughs> um as we lead up to graduation I just want to mention how our first job as student reps so the new reps can definitely understand um is obviously the inclusion and equality of all our students within the district But um, whether you're graduating this year or going into another year of high school, all opinions and voices matter. Um, The memories I have made at LHS are never ending. And looking at the front entrance of what I will always know as my high school, um, where I found my identity, the things I stand up for, and the people I will remember for the rest of my life, it seriously feels like missing my bus the first day of freshman year, which just yesterday, Mm -hmm. and um, catching the Vernon Hills ride instead. That was fun. (laughs) Yeah. Shout out to Mr. Sullivan when I walked in late uh, to his geometry class and he made me explain to the entire class. <laughs> but um, yeah, over these past four years, I've had teachers, students and administrators that I've looked up to so much and um, will admit tried to mimic the insane character that they exhibit within their career and um, the care they have for this district. And then um, moving on to my thanks to the board. Um, wrapping up this last report, I want to genuinely thank the board for all that you have done for our students, for our staff, for parents, for our community, and everything within our district. Um, I really see the care and seeing that endeavor inspires me, and I'm sure the rest of our student board members will lead in wherever we go um, after we graduate and be the best versions of ourselves. Um, I also would like to thank Dr. K specifically for the amazing role model he has been to me. And something specifically I've always seen in Dr. K is his crazy kindness and complete understanding for our students. Even during COVID, I saw the way Dr. K listened to all different types of opinions and made sure that all students were comfortable within their school. Um, As Mrs. Fisher said, the support and aid you have given our district does not go unnoticed, and I will remember it when I go off to college. So thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) So... Um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> We're going to go down the line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really quick. Just a little yeah. Really, really quickly. Yeah. You, you don't have to rush. We're enjoying your final report. <laughs> yeah. um, I also just wanted to thank the board for everything you've done to make us feel comfortable in sharing our opinions and the opinions and experiences of other students. Um, it's great to know that you're always willing to hear us out at the meetings and Ms. Hessel at our lunches um, and just take time to value that and really feel like we can contribute as students um, to the school policy. Um, Thank you. And I'm not just going to repeat everything they say. So all that goes, and I would just implore you guys to keep pushing students to participate and take advantage of the full, you know, how, how great our schools are and how many opportunities and uh, activities they can do. Just keep pushing students to take advantage of everything that Libertyville and Vernon Hills has to offer. And now I'm going to single out Dr. K because We all want to just express our sincere gratitude for you because we work with you obviously the most or more than any of the other ones on the board. So um, I'm speaking for the three of us here and probably the most of the student body. I don't know if there's another principal like you who goes above and beyond for students as often as you do. I've only had two principals in my life. Let's just say you're not my second favorite. (laughs) (laughs) You make an effort to know all the kids that go to Libertyville and they're so easy to approach. You always make sure to get student feedback, and that is a large part of why Libertyville is such a successful high school. Over the past year, you took the time to personally meet with me, and I'm sure other people on multiple occasions to discuss anything that I felt was important to the school. For that, I'd like to thank you. But again, this doesn't just apply to those who hold positions of leadership, such as us representatives, but any kid that goes to Libertyville High School. I'm not sure how many of you were at D128 when he was hired, but he is a gem, so keep hold on to him for as long as you can. You set an extraordinary example for students and faculty, 
And one of the things us three will miss most about Liveryville is not being able to see every day. So again, thank you for being a role model and to us and know that everyone at Liveryville appreciates and notices all the hard work and dedication you put into being principal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Dr. G for everything you've done for us, not just as board reps, but also as students. It really shows that you prior prioritize the students when you think about the school. And like we've definitely had a weird high school experience with COVID and everything, but you have really tried to make it still the best four years for us. And I really appreciate everything you've done for us. And I also want to say thank you to Dr. Herman and Mrs. Hessel, um, because you've just you've both just inspired me so much this past year. First, just seeing like two women in a leadership role is something that you don't see very often in society today. And because of that, I look, I look up to both of you so much. And you both show so much dedication, hard work, and passion. I aspire to be like you guys. And you've shown me that anything is possible. And I also just want to say thank you to the whole board for showing and teaching all of us that our opinions are really valued and that even as like people as young as us, that we can really make a change. Yeah, so I'd like to thank, again, the board in general. Uh, this opportunity for all of us is just something that is unique and is life-changing because of how young we are. This is not, again, like a normal thing to really do and be in like a government setting. Um, I really appreciate how you guys, I can tell, especially by the way you're looking at me right now, that you guys actually care what we're saying <laughs> and, and, you, and you take that into account. And so even when we were really bad in the beginning and we kind of got better at the end, <laughs> like you, you still stuck with us and still listen to us. And again, just appreciate us. Uh, Dr. G, again, thank you for having us have this opportunity. And yeah. Um, I did not plan anything, so I will try. Um, but starting off with Dr. G, thank you so much. This year, I've had throughout high school kind of a hard time believing in myself. It's kind of a thing I've always doubted myself. And I feel like you have been one of the people to just like believe in me more than myself. And that's pushed me because you were such like an important person. It's like, oh my God, the principal. So scary when I first came into school. And now seeing that I can be like on a level with you, I can talk to you. I can talk to all of you guys, like the board, people that I look up to. That's something that I didn't think I would be able to do my freshman year. And it's just a really, really cool experience that I've been able to treasure this year. And just overall, like my time at Vernon Hills has been amazing. I've been able to do like I've been able to have great opportunities doing anything that I want. I'm a very big like theater kid, but I've been able to do, you know, journalism, other music things, academic things. Like I've been able to do whatever I want. And that's something that I really don't think I would have gotten at many other schools. And I'm just very thankful for everyone here for being able to give me this opportunity as a school board rep, but also just to make this school district as great as it is. So. Thank you guys so much. Mr. Carmichael, this applies to you too, just so you know. I know you're not here, <laughs> but we're talking to you too. <laughs> so happy. Nice, Faith. Well, um, we have some gifts for you, but before we ask you to join us at the podium so we can hand them out, I just want to tell you how grateful we are to you. You guys have devoted more hours than we could count to making sure that student voice was represented when we made decisions. Um, I also want to thank Dr. G and Dr. K. Um, once again, you've selected a wonderful cross-section, a diverse group to try to capture all voices. Um, and I, I will say, you didn't start badly. You started fine, but... We, we were okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been a thrill to see each one of the six of you sort of find your voice and the difference between the reports at the beginning of the year to the reports at the end of the year are really, uh, it's been a real joy to see you develop and really find your voice and, and do your best to represent as many sections of the student voice as you possibly could um, and really let us know uh, what the students were thinking. And as I've told you before, we always start with student board rep reports because we never want to lose our focus that we are here because of you. So we thank you. Uh, we are grateful for all the hours that you put in because you could have been doing something else, but you helped us be a better board of education and make better decisions. So thank you.
Do you guys want to help hand these out? <laughs> should we sit here or should we get up? All right, we'll get up. All right. Push in the chair. Hey, Sophia. Hi. I have to switch them. Thank you. <sighs> Got John. Last not least, Kate. All those team photographs here, and then we'll sort of try to do the end caps next to you. That's what we have. Yeah, hold on. Can you see everybody? Oh my gosh. So for as emotional as Dr. G and I are to say goodbye to such outstanding board reps, we are equally as excited to welcome in um, and introduce to you, our, our school board, our incoming student board reps. Um, I know I speak for Dr. G when I say we had not only um, many outstanding students apply for this position, um, but we feel great about the students who ultimately were selected to represent our student bodies next year. So I'll start with our Libertyville group. Uh, we have three students. Um, all of them are rising seniors. So we have um, starting there with Fatima Elementary. You can stand there, I guess. Well, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll figure it out. Uh, Sarah Wu. And um, I'm totally nervous and I'm blanking, Jasmine. I'm blanking on your last name. I want to say Kerber, but I know that's wrong. Oh my gosh, Jasmine Lafita, a student I've known since freshman year. Sometimes get the best of me too. Happens to the best of us. All right, thanks, Dr. K. I, uh, I do want to just say thanks to you six. It's been a great year and I appreciate the, the opportunity that we've had to get to know you, build relationship but uh, just to see you uh, grow in your leadership as well. I am excited to name our three new board reps for next year. Uh, we had a record number of um, applicants, so it was super difficult. And these three represent uh, just the best and brightest from Vernon Hills. We're happy to have them uh, with us next year. So uh, Sophia Marin. Ariel Schifrin. Ari June. See y'all, we look forward to working with you next year. And although you have some very big shoes to fill, we know you're gonna do a great job. I had the pleasure of uh, joining them for lunch with uh, most of the outgoing student board reps. They gave advice to the new student board reps, and I know that they're gonna do an outstanding job, so. And before I conclude my president's report, um, it is with uh, 
mixed emotions that I acknowledge the retirement of our friend and colleague, Dr. Rita Fisher. So I, I've known it's been coming for a really long time. Um, and I am very excited for you to move on to this next chapter of life. But um, as a board, we've been very spoiled by having you part of our team. We have always known that whatever you say, um, we can rely on and that it's in the best interest of the district to listen to you because of your brilliance and your experience and the heart that you bring to your work. You will be very missed. Um, I'm going to embarrass you with just a real brief recap. Um, Dr. Fisher graduated from Libertyville High School in 1976. Seven. Seven. I'm sorry. <laughs> Seven. No, no, you're 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 very young, very very young indeed. Um, before coming to District 128 as the assistant superintendent uh, in July of 2013. Um, she had 21 years of experience uh, at Grays Lake High School um, as a teacher, a department chair, an associate principal, and as their director of curriculum instruction before we were fortunate to lure you back home. Um, I'm, I, I, I do want to say your credentials. You earned a BA in social sciences and secondary education and a master's in curriculum instruction from Barrett College a master's in educational leadership from Northern Illinois University and a doctorate in educational leadership from National Lewis. Um, but more importantly, you were really the leader of the team that developed our daring mission. Um, the daring mission is what it is because of you. Um, also the, as we heard tonight, the um, PBL experiences, uh, both for students in Berlin, as well as for the staff, um, in uh, Montgomery and Selma and Atlanta. Um, that's a really special part of your leadership that you brought um, that enabled us to move beyond the walls of our buildings and really um, enrich teacher experiences as well as students' experiences. Um, so I am very excited for the next chapter of your life. I am very sad to see you go. You will be sorely missed. And um, thank you for your dedication to District 128. And since you don't live far, anytime you want to join us as a guest for a board meeting, you know where to find us. We'll be happy. And thank you so much for your kind remarks and for the opportunity to serve this district, which has just been the most rewarding, among the most rewarding um, experiences of my career. To, to finish here is, is icing on the cake. <laughs> thank you. And that concludes <laughs> the president's report. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Um, President Hessel. Yes. Just while we're doing some introductions and while we're doing some goodbyes, yes. could I just take the liberty of introducing mm -hmm. a new team member at LHS who uh, joined us tonight? That would be great. Um, just a quick second to introduce Mr. Vernell Glover, who will, uh, pending board approval later on in this meeting, uh, be joining Libertyville High School as one of our, our new team leaders for our Q through Z LST. Um, Mr. Glover is currently the Dean of the Freshman uh, Academy at Hillcrest High School and has experience working as an assistant principal at Bloom High School and a district director of CTE. Um, so we are just ecstatic to have him um, joining our D128 team and for him to become a wildcat in the fall. So <laughs> welcome, Mr. Glover. Welcome. Okay, on to superintendent's report. Um, and I have a few more morsels of good news to share, although we've celebrated quite a bit already. Um, both D128 math teams ended the competition season on a high note 
with the Vernon Hills math team placing fourth in the ICTM state competition on April 30th and LHS placing sixth. This afternoon, this is hot off the press, the Computer Science uh, Teacher Association and Info System Foundation announced its 2022 Computer Science Teaching Excellent Award winners, and Vernon Hills Computer Science teacher Adam Lucan was among the 10 recipients. Hey. Yes. Uh, winners excel in inspiring students to explore the computer science field, engaging students in learning rigorous standards-aligned computer science content, and broadening the participation of underrepresented students in computing. So again, congratulations to Adam. We were able to see him this morning when he first got the word, and he was so terribly excited. Um, next, Vernon Hills senior Elizabeth Kalika and Libertyville senior Laura Gomez Añez were two of the eight students chosen from a statewide pool of over 1,100 students to present their research at the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition Student Research Showcase last Thursday at the Nexus Center in Chicago. Both D128 students spoke on their research and then responded to questions from a guest panel of entrepreneurs and community leaders. Libertyville school nurse Cam Trout was honored at the first ever Lake County Educator of the Year ceremony held May 4th at the Lake County Fairgrounds. She was recognized along with other school district lead nurses for the amazing work she did during the pandemic. And um, public education advocates throughout the state were honored for their support of their local schools and districts during the INSPRA Annual Distinguished Service Award luncheon on May 13th. Uh, the combined LHS and VHHS College Resource Center teams were among the 40 individuals and teams honored. An award of excellence was presented to the team of Amy Belstra, Sarah Cardinal, and Re Kelly Reddig from Libertyville, and Becky Belito and Rihanna Weil from Vernon Hills. And three Vernon Hills students earned the ranking of state finalist at the History, uh, Illinois History Day competition. Um, our state finalists are Ethan Nixie and Lily Zartler for a group exhibit on the annexation of Hawaii. David Wang, who wrote a research paper um, on the U.S. and its roles in Puerto Rico. And in addition, we had one group qualify for nationals, Jack Gagamov and Preston Wright for a group exhibit on post-World War II reconstruction. And that is all of our good news. Wow. Next up um, for my report, um, I'm going to abbreviate it just based on the time and the rest of the agenda. Um, but the board will be in uh, June um, engaging in a pretty rich conversation about the work we've been leading up to all school year, and that is our strategic plan. Um, so when we uh, began this work in the fall, we were answering the question, where do we want, where are we now and where do we want to be? And from input with the board about wanting some measurable goals to accompany our awesome daring mission. Um, and so through work with the community, through work with the staff throughout this year, we have identified uh, daring vision, which we've shared previously. And from st stakeholder input and staff input, we are recommending um, goal areas to the board. The three goal areas that came to the top of the 12 that you all wrestled with um, back in April um, are student health and well-being, um, student, uh, excuse me, equity and inclusion, and multiple paths to success. Um, there are, we, we will be re recommending those to you from the uh, voices of the strategic plan committee. So I will have for all of you a summary of their notes and recommendations, a summary of all of the conversations that we've had to date, um, because one of the main important roles of the school board is to set the direction and to set measurable goals that you then hold us accountable to. Um, so in uh, June, we will be discussing the recommendations as well as your perspectives on what you would like to see as evidence of us working towards those measurable goals over the next three to five years. Um, so I just wanted to foreshadow that we're getting so close. I mean, you will all receive information from me in your inbox um, that will help prepare you for that dialogue in June. 
So will we be uh, receiving that information at the June committee meeting? I will send it ahead of time, but the conversation will take place at the June 20th special meeting. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And next we have a COVID update from Bryant Kelly. Thank you. Um, so just brief COVID update. Uh, again, if you've been watching the news, Lake County is still in community level medium. Um, and that's just uh, some of the things is to stay up to date on your COVID-19 vaccines, uh, get tested if you have symptoms. And if you're at high risk for severe illness, talk to illness, talk to your healthcare provider. Um, you know, we are finishing out the school year. And so we have finished with um, uh, testing that we had all year, voluntary testing for um, fully vaccinated staff and then staff that were unvaccinated, we're testing weekly. And so I just like to thank Passport Health. Um, they're, you know, a local company. They worked with us all year for the past couple of years. Um, and so just like to thank them for their flexibility and working through our schedule that uh, allowed our teachers and staff to test weekly. So that's all I have. Wonderful. Um, next, uh, we had three FOIA requests for information. The first um, was received on May 2nd from Dale Sherman, requesting any and all records, documents, and communication related to out-of-district students attending classes at Libertyville High School, reference to out-of-school districts paying tuition to attend Libertyville High School, and other related uh, possible sources of information uh, connected to that. Um, we sent the response on uh, May 9th and two hours were spent. The next was received um, a request for emails in reference to critical race theory or transgender origin originating from outside the district between January 1st, 2022 and May 6th, 2022. Um, we responded to that on the 13th and time spent was six hours. And the third one uh, was requesting email addresses for all of the board members. Um, we responded to that on May 18th and uh, time spent was a few minutes because your email addresses are available on our website, but we made sure that that person knew that. And that is the conclusion of my superintendent's report. Wonderful. Thank you. We will move on to item five, our consent vote agenda. These are items that were discussed in committee. May I have a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed? So moved. Second. Great. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Great. The motion passes. We will move on to item number six, our PNP committee. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Okay, Benson. Thank you. Uh, a few items on the agenda here. Um, the first one is the resolution to adopt the e-learning days um, as we uh, reviewed earlier in the, um, the beginning of this meeting. So uh, if we could have a motion for that. I move to adopt the e-learning days for the 2022-23 through 2024-25 school years. Second. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Motion passes. The second item is an agreement with the Rise Aquatics Team um, Club, I should say, uh, formerly the Cats Aqu. <laughs> Why am I having trouble? To <laughs> uh, aquatics. Um, and this has to do with the use of the uh, LHS swimming pool. Um, is there any, Brian, do you have any background on this? So we talked about this again at uh, PMP committee, and uh, we normally sign a, a yearly agreement with Cats Aquatics. We adapted the this yearly agreement, primary use of uh, the Libertyville High School swimming pool. Um, and Part of the reason is that Vernon Hills Park District, we're uh, working with them on the use of the Vernon Hills um, pool, swimming pool, and us, uh, District 128, utilizing some of their facilities. So those agreements are still in the works. Um, we talked about that a little bit. And so um, that's why this agreement looks a little different than in years past. Okay. Can we have a uh, motion, please? 
I moved to um, pass the agreement with Rise Aquatics Club, formerly Cats Aquatics, for the use of the LHS swimming pool. I second. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments from the board? Again, this was reviewed, discussed earlier in the uh, in the month. So, I think, Don, did you have Don? One? Did you have something? I do. Uh, so the uh, employees that work for uh, Rise don't work for the district and therefore don't have to compete any or complete any uh, training that that we would give all of our employees. So my question is, uh, do we have any oversight into what training they do receive? They're working with our students. Um, do we know what it is that they need to do in order to be prepared to work with our students? So, uh, so since they are, fall under USA Swimming Club and Illinois Swimming Club, they would follow all the rules that are provided by you know, USA Swimming association and what they need to do. So whether that's from lifeguard certification, coaching certification, and then all of their rules, because their insurance and all that is through USA Swimming. So they need to follow all of their rules. We do um, run background checks on uh, the, the coaches that come in for Rise Aquatics. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Comments? By the fees, are we kind of in line of where we've always been or is this a reflect kind of an increase? It's the, the same uh, cost that, so we just increased it by CPI. So um, each year, so we haven't made any changes, even though really they've gone down a little bit in the amount of probably pool usage, but the rate they're getting is, is pretty good. Thanks, Cara. And thanks, Don. Any other? Okay, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Grumke. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Okay, motion passes. The next one is an intergovernmental agreement with uh, District 73, uh, Hawthorne District 73, about sharing of student data for educational study. Um. So um, again, we did talk about this at uh, PMP, um, but this would be the opportunity for both District 73, District 128 to be able to um, share some of our student data, longitudinal data to look at um, how students perform, uh, you know, beyond for like District 73, how they perform once they leave 73 and come to here. And likewise, for us to be able to go back in time and look at a student and see how they progress. Um, we're also um, talking with um, Roundout uh, District um, and District 70 and District 68. So those are still in the works, um, but all, this, all, the, all of them indicate that they would like to also have the same um, data sharing agreement so that we can um, you know, look at that data and then obviously make any changes that we need to for the you know, betterment of our students. And as I recall, this came about because of some legislation that was passed earlier um, um, in the fall. La in last fall, yep. yeah, uh, related to this, allowing us to be able to do this and give this uh, uh, information, send this information back and forth. Um, okay, thank you. Can we have a motion, please? I move to pass the intergovernmental agreement with District 73, sharing of student data for educational study. Second. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? Again, this was uh, discussed earlier in committee uh, earlier in the month. No, hearing none. Uh, roll call, please. Rumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda is the. Uh, uh, fiscal year uh, 23 consolidated district plan. Uh, and again, this was discussed earlier in the month. Uh, Dr. Fisher, do you have any quick background on this? Sure. A quick summary is the consolidated district plan is a planning and information sharing tool developed by the Illinois, Illinois State Board of Education uh, for districts to coordinate their communication um, regarding four uh, federal grants that we received, Titles 1, 2, 4, and IDEA. And so the legislation requires that we complete the application indicating our plans for uh, the use of the title funds. Um, 
and that the board approve that consolidated plan in order for the district then to go ahead and submit the individual applications for each of those title grants. So this is really an overview of all of our grants, followed by once approved by the board and uh, approved by the Illinois State Board of Education, we then open up and complete the individual grants for individual applications for each of the title grants. What you've seen is really an overview of our process and determining needs and allocating funds under those grants. Okay, thank you. Can we have a motion, please? I move to approve the fiscal year 23 consolidated district plan as presented. Second. Okay, thank you. Any uh, further comments or questions by the board? Rita, I can't imagine that you're going to miss having to compile all of that information. <laughs> well, there, there are some things that I truly enjoy about the work that I do. You saw the presentation tonight. I would probably not rank this one number one as John <laughs> earlier. Discussion of it's principles. a paraphrase. <laughs> Thank you for attending to it. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Essel. Aye. Cole Carney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grumke. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, we have the proposed 2022-2023 committee and board meeting schedule, uh, which we have to approve every year. So uh, it's presented here in your packet. Um, uh, the Are typical Monday uh, dates uh, continuing on our, our current process. Any other, I don't think we need any other background. We, this Isn't is- Isn't there a date that we were talking about? It's in this school year. This, okay. So this is yeah. for next. Yeah. yeah, this is for next year. Yeah. Yeah, because we had uh, updated our our calendar. Yeah, for the last month. couple of meetings yeah. Yeah. for this yeah. fiscal, this school okay. year. Can we have a motion, please? I move to approve the proposed 2022-23 committee and board meeting schedule. Second. Thanks, Don. Um, any questions or comments about this? Okay, and uh, once passed, it'll be uh, posted on the website and everyone will know when our meetings are. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Cole Carney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Okay, motion passes. We have a list of employment of employees. These are ones that came in after the uh, committee meeting earlier in the month, so uh, are separate from uh, the ones that we voted on in the consent agenda. So uh, can we have a motion uh, to approve these? Motion to approve employment of employees. Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments on these? Okay. We have a roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. And last but not least, we have educational tour requests. We can do this with one motion, I assume, or do that. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure we do that. It's been a while since we've had a lot of these, so mm -hmm. you, know, you sort of forget. Uh, so we have two uh, educational tour requests, one for the summer of 2022, <clears throat> which is coming up the National Leadership Conference in Chicago for the uh, DHHS uh, FBLA uh, group. And then the um, for the 2022-2023 school year, we have a choir uh, trip in September and the LHS Latin students uh, tour to Italy in uh, spring of 23. And I know they are not taking any chaperones. I just <laughs> throw it out there. Yeah. Again, as much as that sounds of, you know, appealing. Being a dead horse, mm -hmm. I would go to Italy. <laughs> yeah. Noted. Yeah. Okay. Can we have a motion, please? Motion to approve educational tour requests. Second. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Uh, motion passes. 
And that concludes the uh, Program and Personnel Committee, and I'll hand it over for an equally jam-packed Facilities and Finance Committee. Yes, and in Chairperson Rooney's absence, I will take us through it. Um, if I'm going to quickly and somebody has something they need to say, please stop me. Um, we will first um, look at the ESSER three grant funds spending plan. Um, we've discussed it at length many times. Um, there was also significant input uh, that we received uh, from the community. And uh, I'm looking for a motion to uh, approve the ESSER three grant fund spending plan. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. <laughs> Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Motion passes. We move on to the resolution to authorize annual deferral of first property tax receipt. Uh, we have discussed this extensively as well, but I am going to ask um, uh, Dan Stanley to give a summary of what this is and what it means. Yeah, for years, um, when we issue financial financial reports, the fund balance numbers include spring taxes that we receive in May, June time period. Um, but we have always added the caveat that's really that money is really for next year. So we've always talked that way. We've even tried to, when we're talking about our fund balance and presenting it, like there's a number and then we take out early taxes because that money is really reserved for the next year. Um, I, we've talked uh, several meetings now where I believe we have the opportunity to adjust our financial reporting so that the end fund balance reporting will not include early taxes and will already be deferred into the future year. So it will just align um, it will align our financial reporting with how we've been talking for a very long time at this district about our fund balances. Um, uh, the cash is still there. The cash is the cash, but fund balance is a different thing. Um, so that's really what this will do starting for fiscal year 22 and going forward. Um, yeah, I think it'll also help the conversation about a fund balance policy that we've had as well. So this is a kind of a foundational change to bring that in a, at a future discussion. Okay, great. And at any um, things to watch out for, things that might look different as a result of this change? Yeah, it, it will. It will make um, it'll make things look um, a little worse, but they're going to look a little more accurate in terms of now that money is not from the newer CPI coming sooner. It's going to come later, and so that will be a little bit delayed. Um, but it's truly a more accurate picture of what's actually happening from an accrual basis. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I please have a motion to approve resolution of authorizing annual deferral of first property tax receipt? I move to approve the resolution to authorize annual deferral of first property tax receipt as presented. Second. Great. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Drum key. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Moving on to the resolution abating the working cash fund and transfer to the capital projects fund. Again, can I ask for a brief summary of what that is? Yep. So we have uh, money in our working cash fund, which is one of the several funds that we have. Um, and our plan to pay for the capital projects that we've done, particularly the LHS field house that was really mostly done last summer. We're kind of wrap up all those, all those payments and then get all the money in the right spots where it needs to be um, for the end of the fiscal year. Part of that process is to essentially transfer $2 million from the working cash fund to the capital projects fund. But technically it's not called a transfer, it's called an abatement. Um, so that, that's, that's really what it is. And so it's essentially a permanent transfer to that fund. Uh, and so that helps, uh, that, that's where, where we're getting part of the cash uh, to pay for the field house project. Okay, thank you. And this was also discussed in committee. Um, can I have a motion to approve the resolution abating the working cash fund and transfer to the capital projects fund? I move, I move to approve the resolution abating the working cash fund and transfer to cap, capital projects fund. Thank you. I have a second. And we have a second, any discussion? Roll call, please. Hessel. Aye. Cole Carney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grumke. Aye. Motion passes. 
Moving on to the D128 transition pathways bid recommendation. This is something we've been working on for quite a while and discussed at length. Um, this bid is for? Uh, 1. 1.332 million. So $1,332,000 with F-Frame, Carlson and Son Incorporated. Um, the, the total cost of this project based on those bids is going to be really close to $2 million. So every time you have a cut, project, you have the trade cost, you have design costs, and then owner costs. So this is this is approving the bids for those, um, for that project. Transition Pathways Program. Great. Can I have a motion to approve the D128 Transition Pathways bid recommendation? With honor, yes. Mm -hmm. I move to approve the D128 Transition Pathways bid. As presented. As presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Roll call. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please. Kulkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Motion passes. Sorry. Move sorry. I'm sorry. Just, you feel better now? We're <laughs> <laughs> texting them. It's passed. Let's it's go. It's a long time to wait for that. Thank you. Um, finally, uh, 7E, an item very near and dear to teenagers' hearts, the uh, food management services agreement. I know. Uh, my 16-year-old son who attends uh, Vernon Hills High School is very much looking forward to what seems like a uh, really exciting improvement to the food that we're able to offer uh, both our students and staff. Agreed. Um, and we will look at this at a future meeting because I don't have the agreement ready. And it, it, I thought I wanted to have it on here in case I kind of had that ready to go. Um, but there's there's one piece of information that I do not have ready yet, and and it's it's on me. It's not on Quest. I want to be very clear. Um, so we're still working that out. So we'll bring this back in June. Uh, but everyone is still moving forward, full steam ahead. We're very everyone's very excited. Fantastic. Well, we've teed it up for uh, the next meeting, and we know that if you press the pause button, that we are happy to wait. So thank you. Uh, moving on to item F, Lake County indemnification agreement. Yep, discussed in committee. It's an annual agreement that basically the county will withhold uh, um, permits for um, unincorporated properties if we tell them that they didn't pay their developer fees. So they'll agree to do that as long as we agree to indemnify them. So annual agreement required by the county. Nothing's changed. It's been virtually the same agreement for years. Great. Can I have a motion to approve the Lake County indemn Indemnification Agreement? Easy for you to say. I'm, right. I'm so moved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Any discussion? Being done, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. Uh, Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, moving on to the disposal of obsolete equipment. We have some uh, desks uh, in the CT department at Vernon Hills High School. Yep, this, um, this came in after our FNF uh, meeting, so normally it would be in consent, but it came in after, so it comes on here. Um, yeah, they've got some student desks that they're, they're replacing, so the new ones are coming, so they have to get rid of the old ones. Yes. Um, can I please have a motion to approve the disposal of obsolete equipment? So moved. Second. Great. Any discussion? I just have one question. Do we uh, ever get, is it important to us to know what happens to it after we agree to have it destroyed? I mean, I know it, they, it's either donated, scrapped, or sold, but would there be interest in knowing what's happened after we agree to have it be destroyed? or disposed of. Yes. Um, we certainly can ask for that information. I just think we're constantly doing, I, I would be interested in seeing how much is donated versus just scrap. Is that something we can bring back to the board? Okay. And in many cases, they probably already know. Right. Already I mean, knows. I don't want to cause my, if it's just yeah. as easy to indicate which one happened to it. Simple follow-up. Yeah. Okay. Roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Okay. Motion passes, and that concludes the Facilities and Finance Committee report.
Uh, we move on to the Illinois Association of School Boards. Nothing for this evening. Thank you. Great. Moving on to the Special Education District of Lake County. Likewise, nothing for this evening. Wow. Uh, let's move on to item 10, future agenda items. Again, just foreshadowing the board discussion, we'll have on the strategic plan. You'll be receiving information from me that shows the results from the different stakeholder groups input and the recommendation to you, as well as sort of the package of what it's going to look like when it's completed. So I look forward to structuring a conversation for all of you in June. Right. Yeah, and we also, and the food service. <laughs> and yes. And um, also we are going to be uh, discussing uh, Dr. Herman's um, evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Herman has completed the self-evaluation portion. Um, has anyone received an email notifying them that that portion was finished? Yes. You have received that email. And I reached out to Carol to uh, remind me of the login procedure. So yeah, it appears that's been de delivered to email. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to follow up with the board um, to make sure they know what the next steps are, including logging in, reviewing it, how to get your portion of the feedback started and then passed back so that we know that it's complete. Um, I'd like to discuss when we're going to complete our portion so that we can have the report to you, a discussion with you in closed session, um, and then have that filed in your employment file before the end of this school year. So um, I know we talked about it briefly at the end of committee last time, what the timeline would be. So I just wanted to clarify when our portions would need to be completed for the next steps. Right. The um, people who... Um did the training for us on super eval on how to best use the tool recommend the board having several weeks to review my self-evaluation and then to um, indicate your own score for me on your rubric and add any comments that you think would be helpful then for the board to come together and have a closed session conversation without me present. So that will allow Lisa to then take the best of your comments and put it into one final summative and then that would happen on June 20th at the special board meeting in closed session. And then at the regular meeting in June is where we would have an opportunity for me to join you in closed session to receive the feedback, both in writing as well as verbally from all of you. And then that would be filed in my uh, employment record by the end of the year. Okay. So if we need to have that conversation on June 20th, could everybody look at their calendar so that we can agree on a date that we will say we will each have our own portion of it completed. So June 20th, that's in three weeks. Would it be possible for everyone to have it, uh, their portion done by June 15th? Sure. Is that reasonable? I think so. Yep. And, and you will, or Carol, you will send us info about the login, right? Because that was my question I was going to ask today is how do I log in? I will be sending out an okay. email confirming next steps. And then if you haven't received your login, um, we have contact information for them to just resend it. Okay. So all right, we'll definitely get that out um, this week for okay. everybody so that you can get started working on it. And I'll confirm that uh, June 15th, Due date. And the 20th, then we will add a closed session Correct. meeting to that. Correct. Date. Because when we're discussing um, any type of employee performance, um, that is one of the things, according to the Open Meeting Act, that we do in closed session for obvious reasons. So, okay. Any other future agenda, future agenda items before we retire to executive session? Okay, then um, we will take a five minute recess um, and then convene an executive session for the purpose of discussing collective negotiating matters, lease of property and employment of an employee. When we return, we will vote on lease of property and then we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Necessary. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I have a motion to move to executive session? So moved. Second. Roll call. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. 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 Yeah.
Kulkarni. Kulkarni. Hi. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Edson. Hi. Benjamin. Hi. Thank you. Great motion passes. We are going to move to executive session after executive session after a five minute recess. Great. So we have returned to open session and we will move on to the next item of our agenda, number 13, for a lease of property. Um, I need a motion to approve the lease of property. Do I need to give any details as discussed in closed session? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Motion passes. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Kolkarni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. You're not going to say no to this one. Aye. Hessel. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.